Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session of Pedagogy of Captivating Technologies by instructor Lauren Britton. The seminar will create a space for our shared online classroom by utilizing Paulo Freire's The Pedagogy of the Oppressed and Bell Hooks' Teaching to Trans Transgress, Education as a Practice of Freedom. Acknowledging that there are as many people in the room as there are teachers, agreeing on a set of shared conditions for working collectively and leaving room for invention and play will be the pedagogical infrastructures implemented in this seminar. Simultaneously, we will read Ruha Benjamin's edited text, Captivating Technology from 2019, to engage with critical questions around social technical systems. The text deals with the physicality of carceral corrections that come with the techno solutionism of wanting to solve all problems through technology. What social groups are classified, quarreled, coerced, and capitalized upon so that others get a chance to tinker, experiment, design, and engineer the future? We will ask, to what end do we imagine? How can inventing new political, cultural, and social norms advance the practice of freedom? And how might techno-science be reimagined towards a more emancipatory ends? These readings will guide the participants to see how radical pedagogical strategies can rewire our social relations in the ever-growing technologically constructed spaces around us. We will ask, what kinds of technologies need to be built to make the present more emancipatory and collective? Together, we will set our guideposts to reset the classroom space, expectations, engage with the queerness of technology's production, and cherish forms of engagement that are assumed to be apolitical. This seminar is an opportunity to slow down, focus on the possible, engage with the impossible, and follow the edges of critical engagement to see what role technoscience has in formalizing the present and what role critical pedagogy has in undoing the stable and the normal. Now, I will introduce uh, Lauren. Uh, Lauren Britton is an interdisciplinary artist and thinker based in Berlin. Britton is currently an artistic researcher on the interdisciplinary project RE, coding algorithmic culture within the gender slash diversity in informatic systems research group at the University of Kassel. I'm now going to pass the mic to Lauren. Please take it away. Hey, Federico, thanks so much for that introduction. And uh, just to say, we still have uh, four people that are not let in um, as panelists. So if we can um, bring them over, that would be great. So um, yeah, is that okay? Cool, thank you so much. Um, so hey everyone, welcome. It's super nice to be here with you all in a way. Um, I will paste one more time this link um, so I've set up a few collective infrastructures for us and you can follow along with uh, kind of the course plan for the day. Um, one of, if, so if you go to line number 84, it is for me on that pad, you can see, oh, I see people are still joining. Um, you can see the information about like how it is that we will organize the day with some ideas about times and kind of a plan just to have an overview. So I guess, um, yeah, maybe just to start, my name is Lauren. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm currently based in Berlin. Um, and like Federico was saying, I research within gender diversity and informatic systems. Um, a large point of my research has been at the intersection of artistic research and critical pedagogy with implications of technology. So it kind of culminated together for this course. Um, yeah, and I guess I'd like to start before going too much into the content of the course with everyone just to say a little hello. Um, so if you could say where your, your name, your pronouns, where you're coming from today, or where you're on the way to, as I see some of us are traveling. And um, also, yeah, if there's anything particular that you're looking for from this course, uh, I'll take notes and the next three sessions that we have beyond today are a bit more open. So I have ideas about what we can do, but it's not totally populated yet. So there's also potential to uh, bring in concerns that you would like to work through. So that's also gonna be important for our time together. Um, because it's a bit awkward, I think, for 
to do this. Maybe what I'll suggest is someone can introduce themselves, I'll pick you, and then you can choose the next person. So it requires you to be on your toes a little bit <laughs> to see who's been chosen or not. So I'll ask um, Agata to start. Hi, my name is Agata. I live in Poland, in the south of Poland. Uh, uh, and I'm a painter and collage artist. Um, and uh, okay, I think maybe <laughs> that's that's all. Uh, so I want to nominate uh, Ariana to introduce herself because we've met uh, before on another educational platform, and we know each other uh, like not in real life but through online life. So <laughs> Agatha, I was missing you from that. Well, but, um, it was just a one month long uh, curatorial initiative, but we met over there and it's been a month since it ended and it's so sad. It's so nice to see you, Agatha, hello. Um, hi everyone, um, my pronouns are uh, she, her, and I'm from Greece. Um, I'm based in Athens. Um, I'm particularly drawn to this course um, because I'm actually in the middle of organizing a workshop with a British Nigerian artist called Anyetie Ekenem um, and it's on the work of Bell Hooks and that, how that ties to his photographic practice. So I'm really keen to dive more into that and get more familiar with the work of Bell Hooks as well as the broader um, theories that we will be discussing. And I would love to nominate um, Alexis. Hi, I'm Alexis Steves. My pronouns are she, her. I'm from the US and I'm based in Brooklyn at the moment. I'm a dance artist and a very, um, I have a vocation as a manual therapist doing hands-on work with people based in massage therapy and structural integration a la Ida Rolf, which is a weird thing. If you're interested in, I can tell you about it. And um, I'm at a crossroads, both in my own practical research and theoretical life. And um, yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm excited for this material. Thank you. And oh, I will tag Aliaxe. Is that the right pronunciation? Yes. Of hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Lauren. I'm glad to be on this course. I'm now in Minsk in Belarus. And uh, regarding my research, uh, at the moment, uh, I'm uh, investing the research in the monstrosity. But I found this course really appealing since we had very strange experience of this involuntary digital detox when in Belarus, the internet was taken down for three days and then there was no cell phone connection. And sort of this link has never been as evident as in those days. So yeah, thank you. And I'll tag uh, Raphael and pronounce he, him, yes. Yes, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. My name is Rafael. Uh, I use he pronouns in him. Uh, I'm from Brazil, Brazilian, and I'm a social scientist. And I was interested in having some readings from Paulo Freire and thinking about uh, questions such as like. Um, monocultures of the mind, uh, concepts such as this or uh, uh, diversity, how to, you know, how to work with diversity concepts, uh, like uh, monocultures are everywhere, like geographically, and it seems that in technology and etc. it's, it's around us also, uh, and, and, and I've, I'm interested in, in thinking such questions and it will be an interesting experiment to be here with all of you. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Sebastian to present himself. Yeah, hey, uh, my name is Sebastian, pronouns he, him. Um, I live in Berlin, Germany, and I'm also excited about this discourse. Uh, I th thought the syllabus was very um, yeah, relevant because I'm increasingly realize realizing how yeah, black feminist um, thinking is super crucial when we talk about technology. Um, I've been reading a lot of Sylvia Winter lately and 
her ideas about uh, the money ground and the limit point of the incomputable, etc., and how her work is recently being taken up by certain scholars that deal with, deal with AI. So yeah, it just seemed very um, appropriate for me to take this course right now. Um, I nominate Alexis. I already went. Can oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, try that. Um, who can I? Jonathan? Yeah, hi. <coughs> oh, sorry, I got a bit of a type. I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm in Madrid currently at the moment. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, and I've been drawn to this course preparing for, to do a PhD, uh, hopefully focusing on the Anthropocene and sort of the political concepts of that. So pedagogy is incredibly important, uh, especially with uh, pedagogy of the oppressed. So sort of being drawn into that. But I've also, also been uh, reading Cynthia Winter and also Tiffany King lately for the Black Shovels Black book. So that's what's sort of been driving me. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So I nominate uh, Kawangi, is that, is that how you pronounce it properly? Sorry. Hi, yeah, yeah. it's Kawangi. Yeah, so it's cool. Uh, my pronouns, he, him. I'm in Kenya, based in Nairobi. Um, I'm a writer, a poet. Um, I'm interested in black studies and traditions, following maybe music and yeah, and philosophies and black feminism and queer theories. Um, I nominate um, Aladdin. Aladdin, yeah? Yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, so my name is Aladdin. I'm right now on the train going to Zurich and I'm where I'm based in Switzerland. Nice to you. And I have a background in fine art and visual anthropology. And I, yeah, I was really interested by the syllabus and it's quite different than the center. And so I had no reference that you gave, so I was really interested in following this class. Thank you. And I will nominate Jesse. Uh, thanks, Aladdin. I'm going to try to briefly say hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, and I'm going to disappear uh, because my internet is going to punish me as soon as I do this. So I'm just going to stop it. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Jesse. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm doing a PhD in philosophy of technology. And um, when I saw this description from Lauren, um, I was immediately interested interested because I'm kind of dealing with um, issues that are very much related to all like the critical inflection points that comes from this literature but it's also an area of literature that I know that I need to bulk up on so to speak that like I also feel is kind of like my responsibility as a future possibly teacher or educator um, to be more uh, well versed in and I'm also interested in um, like gaining perspectives that kind of uh, rather than description or critique, possibly offer some very uh, well-founded and um, uh, uh, different perspectivizations of what should possibly be done or what could be done um, within like a general uh, technological capacities. Um, so I'm very interested in that. And since I dropped out a bit ago, I hope I'm not repeating my nomination, um, but I'm just gonna nominate Maria. All right, um, thank you, Jesse. Yep. And okay, so my name is Maria, I'm she, her, and I live in the US. Right now I'm in like Detroit area, um, but I'm kind of rogue right now. I'm also kind of like in between um, stages in life and I'm very interested in like theories of pedagogy, that's what attracted me to this seminar. Um, and I'm interested in like this idea of a safe space and how to, like what are the pillars of holding together um, a space for pedagogy and unbounded learning and different types of like, like ways of starting from um, the assertion of equality of minds, which 
I think is, I don't know, to me, to me, it's, it's, uh, it's very important. Um, I come from a background of like art, but I've kind of veered off into philosophy and um, taking this autodidactic path of self learning and reading in groups together and um, trying to like bootstrap my education into other fields. So I think I'm the last one. I'm not sure. I don't think there's anyone else. That's right. Yeah, cool. Yeah, um, but I don't want to leave out Federico as the moderator. Would you also like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm currently a certificate student in the new center. Uh, this is probably my, my year, my complete year. I'm also interested in, in the colonial thought, probably not like, uh, well, seeing it from, from a Latin American perspective, it's like really weird how uh, the colonial thought is like enacted in, in, in Europe and uh, North America. So it's like uh, cool seeing like the differences uh, that, that are in, in the practice of the colonial thought. And uh, yeah, currently I'm also researching about uh, trying to rejoin their, uh, let's say structure and materialism well, that's my current status in research, and it's something that it, it's like very cloudy still. But yeah, that's that's basically it. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much. And uh, hey, it's really like uh, it's humbling to be here with all of you, with so many different contexts represented and so many different places that you're all coming from. So thanks for the time and thanks for being here all together. Um, yeah, so the next thing that oh, we're gonna go to, if you can follow along with me on the pad, is that um, I've got two shared infrastructures that I wanted to propose. Um, the idea would be that we have two ways of note taking that we can share as a group throughout the course. And so one is um, to use this pad as a way to take notes and people can type into it. Um, please like please feel invited to move things around to add to if you have any links that you would like to add to share with the group um, I've put some links at the top here that feel related for me um, but they're just suggestions of things to kind of dig into I the two ways that I wanted to propose that we take notes for this course is one by drawing and two by just typing into this pad um, so at the very top on like line three, you'll see drawing notes. So I'd like to ask for people to sign up for each course to have two drawers and two note takers. Um, so if people would feel, and this will serve as your presentation requirement um, for the course. So if people could please sign up um, under the first day, just so we know who's responsible for that, you'll see, um, you'll see that on each day. It's on like line 87, so you can put your names there. Um, yeah, and I guess the idea is to create different points of access and different ways of documenting the discussions that we'll have here. So if people could go ahead and do that. Um, sorry. And I see that some people do not have access to the pad, which is quite essential. So let me go ahead and do that. Huh. I think we may have lost Federico. Nope. Now he's back. <laughs> so um I will hold on. Yeah, cool. Thanks. So when people are signed up for that, we'll move along. You could also choose a different day. Does it show that I signed up as drawer one? It does. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ariana, if you want to sign up for next session, you can put your um, name under next, there, there should be the next week under there as well.
and it might be that you have to do it twice. And because we're 14. No, I think everyone could do it just once and it would be enough. Yeah, I'll put the link here for our drawers. It's also up at the top. Would anyone like to take notes this time? You could also say no. <laughs> okay, well, I won't pressure anyone into doing that. So if you'd like to take notes this time, you're very much welcome to. Thanks, Ariana. I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so maybe the idea would be to do it like underneath the homework for this time or something like that. You could take notes. Um, and if anyone wants to help out Ariana, that would be cool. Is this pad accessible for everyone? Or are you having an okay time navigating it? Yeah? Okay, cool. If there's anything that's unclear about it, you please just let me know. Um, cool. So does someone, we're going to start, ooh, uh, Jesse's coming back. Okay. Um, would someone like to pick a page for me in between 91 and 104? Um, it's from in between 91 to 104. And what are we looking at? <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking at this. Um, this is M Archive, After the End of the World by Alexis Pauline Gums. And to start today, I'm going to read you a poem. <laughs> so I would like for you to choose me. Um, one, someone would, should choose a page in between 91 to 104. 92. 92, okay, thank you. Okay, so this is page 92 from M Archive After the End of the World by Alexis Pauling Gums. And it's from the chapter section, Archive of Fire. We're gonna use this book at a different point throughout the course. So this is just a bit of a preview. She didn't know she was waiting. She only knew she was breathing. And her breathing shifted to the breathing of a being that knew something was moving, that something was coming closer and closer every day. So she waited. For what? She didn't know. Could she say for whom? Or was that just wishful thinking? At some point, she heard new voices, not known voices, not the voices she knew. The new unknown voices sounded frozen and far away and close and closer like breaking shells. They asked, where are you? And she said, here, but not with her mouth, just with her being. She said here repeated infinitely, just by the fact of her being here. At last she felt a connection. As she could not move, she could not see, and she could not smell anything or have any real sense of what the sulfur was doing to her skin or whether she had skin at all. She just stayed there, but that was the arrival. And without needing her long beat out eardrums, they asked her the question, have we made the crossing? And that was when she knew finally she could cry. So I will include this PDF. Um, Another infrastructure is that I've taken good use of the Google Classroom for this um, course. So if you, the new center provided access, I believe, to everyone there. So this book um, I will upload. And um, there's also the major texts from the course are also uploaded on the Google Classroom. So you'll have access to that. And if you need any help with that, just let me know. So, if everyone could come to line, yeah, thanks Frederico for the link. 
If everyone could come to line 60 on the pad. Um, I wanted to introduce some collective conditions for the course. And so my suggestion would be for us to go ahead and read these out. Um, we can do a similar kind of nomination thing like we just did. And if you have a like, but or a disagree moment or a like, I don't like that, let's kind of collect those and we can save them for the end and we can discuss. So these are some collective conditions that I like to offer when teaching classes. Um, but they don't they don't work for everyone and they're specific to what my experience. So I'd be really happy for people to say that doesn't work for me or I would also like to add this. Um, but just to start. Mm, yeah, I could do that. Um, oh, it says that my screen sharing is disabled. Federico, would it be possible to change that? Yeah, one second. I think we have to give uh, a permit. Okay. I think I would need to make you a host and then we would need to go back after you've uh, shared your screen. So I'm just going to do that right now. Okay. Yeah, or maybe you could let everyone screen share would be good as well. I think it should be working right now. Oh yeah, okay. I see it is now. Cool. So, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. So I can start with the first one and then I will ask, um, I can pass it along like we did before. So the first um, kind of collective guideline I'd like to offer is please don't take screen grab grabs that include faces, which I realize is a bit of a funny one because we're being recorded. So maybe we can have a discussion about that as well, seeing as this is precisely the intersection of our course. Um, but we are at a, we're currently on Zoom, which is a heavily extractive platform in regards to data. So this is also an invitation for anyone who'd like to check into their data practices to do so. Um, let's see, I will pass along to, um, come along, Gay. What was that again? Um, I wanted to pass along to you. Would you read out the second one of the uh, guidelines? Um, if anyone would like to share the duties of translating or closed captioning, let's talk about how this can happen. And you, would you like to pass along to someone else? Um, Maria. Oh, sorry. Am I reading the next line? Yes, please. Yes, okay. Um, in this class, there is not a mandate when it comes to turning on or off cameras. Let's do whatever feels right for you. Um, and I'm going to pass on to Ariana. No, well, actually, don't correct others on minor mistakes. Well, actually, a TLS handshake, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> Will you pass along? And I would love to pass it along to Alexei. Alexei. Uh, yes. Um, one diva on mic, don't interrupt. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I would like to pass it to uh, Alexis. Uh, emoticons for speaking are. I'll pass it on to the Raphael. Emoticons for slowing down are three points. I will pass it to Jonathan. Privacy is more than personal stories stay within the room. I would like to pass it on to Aladdin.
Did you say my name? Sorry, I will cut, but I can read it, okay. Uh, movement is good and taking care of your own needs is good. Leaving space for silence is good. And I will ask, see, see any faces, Federico to read the next one. Sure. Uh, the next one is leaving the room and coming back in is good. And I would pass it on to Jonathan. Be mindful of speaking times and use your voice to speak up. And I'll pass it on to uh, Ariana. I already went, so. Oops, sorry. Uh, pass it on to Jesse. Yeah. Um, no isms. This is a space that welcomes all genders, is decidedly anti-racist and anti-ableist. There's no rooms for isms such as classism, racism, ableism, misogyny, ageism, religious discrimination, or any other form of discrimination and oppression. Uh, thanks for the long one, John. Um, okay, and I'll pass it on to who was uh, Agatha? Yes, thank you. Um, not all disabilities are apparent. Uh, please don't assume what is normal for other people. Uh, oh, okay, and uh, nominating uh, somebody will be quite uh, problematic. Sebastian, uh, uh, maybe? Uh, there is as many teachers in this room as there are people in this space. Oh wait, sorry, I have to... Who didn't go yet? Maybe... Mm. Is there anyone left? I think Raphael didn't go. Who? Um, so I, I didn't hear. I think Raphael, did you go? Ah, Raphael. I think so. Read comments, but I can read uh, this uh, line. Um, this is a multi language space. Please ask for clarification or translation. And I'd like to invite Alexei, maybe, to read the next one. Uh, okay. Um, Caretaking is a responsibility shared by everyone. Please feel free to check in with your neighbor and neighbor feel free to say yes or no. Uh, Maria? Um, yes, uh, accept, that, accept that mistakes will be made. Cool. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute so I can come back and see everyone. So one thing that I was noticing that didn't make sense when I or that I would like to change perhaps um, <laughs> is that I think that maybe we could use the little love thing to send like praise to what someone is saying and maybe we could have another um, sort of emoticon for if you would like to raise your hand if you don't feel like you can get an, a word in. Uh, would that be in a change that people feel okay with? Yeah, cool. So I'll change that in the so maybe what would be a good like way to be like, hey, I have a hand raise. Does anyone have a suggestion? Um, change it in the pad. Maybe we would go with default uh, Zoom tool for the hand raise at least. Sure, we could try that. Does everyone feel is I, it works? No, I guess I haven't used it before. Shall we try it? Oh yeah, I see. Uh, how do you do it? Sorry. Um, you go, you need the little participants window. So you click on the bottom, there's participants. And when you click on it, there should be like a little panel opening up on the right. Mm -hmm. And then underneath the list, you can raise your hand and then uh, lower your hand as well. I wonder if I can't do that because I'm the, <laughs> maybe I can't, but I suppose if everyone else can, that's fine. <laughs> 
and then maybe just emoticons for uh, sending appreciation. Cool. Um, does anyone else have any other um, edits or changes or things that they don't care for from the yeah, list? One thing is that can we save chat box actually for ourselves? But anyways, that's available in Google's, Google Classroom, right? After each session. Uh, okay. Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So then, yeah, that will be accessible afterwards. Are there any other um, changes or disagreements? These all sound good to everyone. They feel comfortable or good in a, maybe not comfortable, but workable. Okay. Um, these can be revisited. So please feel free if there's something that um, you'd like to update throughout the course, we can do that. So that space is open. Um, cool. So I'm going to do um, a little bit of an introduction. Um, I will read some stuff um, in an effort to make things more accessible on the Google Classroom. I'm going to read for about 10 or 15 minutes. What I'm reading to you is also accessible there. So if you'd like to go to the Google Classroom and pull it up, um, it's just called you don't have to, because I'll also read it to you, but it's called First Class Notes. So this is a bit of an introduction. Cool. So this course centers Black feminism as a site of innovation and thought, not only as a reference. Classroom code. Um, I don't have that. All right, Sorry. that's fine. Okay. Um, maybe Federico can help, but I'll, I'll come back. So this class is an invitation to think together on a series of questions. One is who is who are upheld as innovators and who innovates? Practices of survival and invention of technologies for survival are often not recognized as innovation. Why is this? This course is an invitation to experiment with processes that attempt to create more access less upholding of racist and colonial infrastructure, and more space for the indeterminate to engage, to emerge. This is why I see the sites of intervention of this course as technology production, into institutional practice, and critical pedagogy. So forms of theoretical production and exchange are often strict and limited. Lectures are provided with a single person lecturing in front of an audience, a little bit like this moment now. Classrooms are architecturally designed around this norm. Zoom took up the idea of privileging everyone's face over their hands or their stomach, for example. Why is this? Teaching a subject is premised on metaphors of mastery. This encourages the question, which kinds of exclusions are imbued in academic practices such as the online classroom, the research project, or the technological object? They continue to assume who is welcome to learn and be in these spaces and who is not. For example, it's not common practice for many online institutions to include captions on their classes. And this is similar within academic or other online conferences. How does this sort of implicit bias structure of who will be present in this space? Through creating access for one group, others are helped along the way. By adding subtitles for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, other groups are helped along the way for people who don't speak English as, as, as well, or with ease, as well as other people that I'm sure we can't anticipate. So by not creating access, how does this reinforce normalization by assuming who will not be here? So this class will focus on engaging with the social model of disability, meaning that what makes someone disabled is not a medical condition, but the attitudes and structures of society. It is society which disables people. This is a similar way of understanding structural racism, whereas not that a person has a different skin color or cultural background that produces exclusion, it is structural and embedded within societal practice and processes that continue to express, to oppress and exclude. This is why as Ruha Benjamin says, who we will focus on on our course, that by doing your job well, you, you can and likely will reproduce all sorts of violent systems that maintain exclusion. This is what I mean when I say that racism, bias against disabled people or trans people and others is structural. 
So with that in mind, what is critical pedagogy? So the emergence of critical pedagogy is often traced back to the works of Paulo Fieri, Henri Giroux, and Bell Hooks, and other radical educators from the second half of the 20th century. Critical pedagogy's basis is the understanding of teaching and learning as political acts and the linking of critical theoretical perspectives to pedagogical implications. As a theory and practice, it focuses on shifting more conventional pedagogies towards theories of social change that reimagine the teaching space as less oppressive and the study of culture as critical. Drawing on various philosophical, philosophical and activist traditions, such as anarchist, feminist, disability, and Marxist theories, critical pedagogy contributes to a decolonial paradigm that challenges domination and the underlying beliefs of dominant practices. As a philosophy of education and, social, and a social movement, critical pedagogy was conceptualized in Brazilian educator Paulo Fieri's work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, from 1968. In this text, he bases, he bases the relationships between teacher, student, and society on co-creation. Fieri critiques what he calls the banking model of education. This is defined as a teacher providing students, as a teacher providing and students receiving knowledge in a disciplined and passive manner. A good student in this model is the one who can empty themselves to receive information from the teacher. Information is not to be questioned, but accepted, deposited, and rendered available upon request. Fieri instead proposes a dialogue-based approach in which learner is positioned as an active co-creator. Fieri and other critical pedagogues highlight praxis as indispensable to teaching and learning and defined it as a situation or an action during which theory, lesson, or skill are enacted, embodied, or realized through practice. So the role of praxis is crucial to the political project of critical pedagogy, which rests on three main assumptions. So these are the three main assumptions of critical pedagogy that praxis can enable social transformation, that teaching and learning are laden with power relations, and that society can be transformed by those who are critically conscious. So the banking model of education was also criticized by Bell Hooks in her work, Teaching to Transgress, uh, Education as a Practice of Freedom from 1994. And this is another text that we'll engage in the course. So analyzing educational experiences in a desegregated US and US schools Hooks in her book shares how norms of whiteness are reinforced and exemplified by limiting learning to the memorization of information and modeling the dialectic student teacher relationship on that of a dominance obedience, authority subservience, and provider recipient binary model that resonate with racialized hierarchies of white supremacy. Such dynamics are reproduced not only in classrooms, but in many other institutional contexts as well. So an alternative proposed by Hooks is to develop learning communities and learning situations in which everyone have the opportunity to behave, enact, and understand themselves to be creative experts. So to be a creative expert, she says, is to be entangled in body, space, and time while learning. And it allows people to be engaged in not just striving to, for theoretical knowledge or only applicable knowledge, but to be creating learning and challenging along the way. So when critical awareness and engagement is practiced, Hooks says, the student teacher teacher student, which is a kind of formulation that she uses of putting the two together, is an active participant and not a passive consumer. So it ensures that teaching, that learning and teaching is not an act of cultural transmission, but of co-production. This opens up possibilities for student teachers to engage with their own situated experiences concerning whatever material they are dealing with. So in this moment in the middle of COVID-19, when many things get reduced to usefulness, this course proposes practices of connection, connecting that are positioned to think through the problematics and possibilities of connection, ask how can we be in contact, and how can we approach the intersection of pedagogy and technology with less certainty. This course invites you with me to imagine a technology otherwise where diverse practices and namings of what we might call technology may flourish, and some things I invite you to hold true with me in this course are that imagination is a resource for finding out and practicing how other worlds may become possible. That it's not only the societal impact of technology that we are constructing, but it's also about the social inputs that structure what kind of technology seem inevitable 
for example, like contact tracing apps, something we're seeing right now, and how others seem impossible or disinteresting. No technology is pre-configured, but the larger context makes some, inevitable, some inventions seem inevitable. Tech fixes for social problems must also interrogate how social norms and structures shape what tools are imagined as necessary in the first place, that everyone in this space is as much of a teacher as they are of a student, including me, and that Zoom is not the only way forward. <laughs> so this is, um, there are some other notes at the bottom here. Um, so this is a little introduction to the course. If anyone has any questions, now would be a moment to have some questions, but also I would like to give a break for maybe about 15 minutes. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please feel free. Otherwise, we'll take a little break before we continue. Um, I'm wondering for the note taking, um, course it's okay so that I um, note take in the, my personal notes since um, I can use the chats alongside a lot easier um, the windows and then quickly copy paste like every five lines or so of notes um, so that I'm not just doing it on um, the pad website whatever way you'd like to do it is totally fine yeah I see the notes coming in as they're formed yeah I guess I also have a related question. Um, is is the drawer or illustrator for the, sub, um, the session like drawing live or is it like a little diagram that, I mean, are we like just doodling or I don't know, like live diagramming or what, 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 what do you think it would look like? I have no idea what it would look like, <laughs> I guess. And is, is, is it done in the moment or can we prepare one for like, after the class is done. I suppose you could do it as a reflection if you prefer, or I mean, I, I guess it would be interesting to think about when we're having conversations. I guess my initial idea was, how would you document a conversation in a drawing? Yeah. Maybe it's an interesting translation, but, um, and what kind of knowledge can be made, made then visible in a different way yeah. um, because of that. But, um, if there's a way that you feel more comfortable with it, it's, there's not meant to be a limit with it. It's just an invitation and something I thought would be interesting to have different uh, drawings along the course to see what different days look like. So, cool. No. I'd like to ask if this poem that you read at the, just at the beginning of the session, if this is, is on the notepad also? Um, the reference is on the notepad, but I can um, put the PDF. I don't think it's currently in the Google Classroom, but I will put it in there. Um, uh, it's in the Google Classroom already. Oh, it is already. Okay, so thank you. Um, it was page 92. Um, maybe we can just annotate that in the... Uh, here. Okay, thank you. I will take a read at it. It was pretty interesting, the, the images that... It had. Uh, yeah, the periodic table of, of elements is in here in a different way, which is also quite interesting. Okay, no worries, I'll have you. Um, okay, so if there's no other, does any other questions about either what I introduced or more structural stuff for the course? I think um, one thing that I've, I find really interesting is the note, because it's such a minor detail, but the note about uh, uh, less certainty, how to approach the intersection of pedagogy and technology with less certainty. I think that's a really fascinating, because um, obviously you put it in there for a reason, the less certainty. Um, and I think it's a really fascinating question um, because that's something I'm dealing with as well. And I'm just wondering how specifically um, certainty will come up um, because there is uh, this opportunity when so many of the technologies that we're dealing with are kind of running on like prob probabilistic readings of the world that are in themselves in some kind of uncertain state. So there's always some sort of threshold that needs to be passed. Um, and I think a fascinating thing to think about, both from a perspective of, of design or um, philosophy, is, okay, what are the thresholds that enable certain things to occur um, and uh, how can these um, certainty thresholds be 
for example, use to redefine how um, social material um, processes become entangled or something like that. And I think I think um, I think this notion of certainty is really interesting because we could also um, engage a kind of like um, yeah techno generative certainty rather than that can re reflect our norms that we usually approach with uh, with some degree of certainty which i think is kind of where where your note is coming from i just wanted to leave that before i forget um leave that mm -hmm. here yeah thanks jesse does anyone else want to pick up on uh, either jesse's comment or anything else Cool. Well, maybe one thing that I will say um, is that I think that what this idea of less certainty, Jesse, is something I've really been thinking about and working with. And in it, um, in uh, Catherine McCutrick's book around Sylvia Winter, she discusses uh, On Being Human as Praxis is the name of the book. She talks about this idea of a universal generalisant, which is this idea that everything can be known and will be known um, and can be captured. And I think that one of the questions that I'm personally interested in at this intersection of critical pedagogy and technological practice is I think that technology has the potential or the drive often to see things through a kind of techno-solutionist paradigm, which is also what Ruha Benjamin will talk about. And this techno-solutionism is that techno-solution, like meaning that technology can fix social problems, right? That there's always a technological solution for a social problem. And this relates back to what Sylvia Winters talks about because this is idea that the entire world can be viewed through a technological perspective. Um, and my argument and that's something that I'm curious to continue to think with you all about is that not everything needs to be known through the lens of, te of technology and some things can't be known through the lens of technology. So that is something that we can approach and think about in all these in hopefully many ways together. Um, but I think thinking with Ruha Benjamin and Sylvia Winter there can be quite helpful. Mm. Cool. Well, then on that note, why don't we take a little break? Um, it's just about six, it's a, well, it's 5.54 in Berlin. So why don't we come back at 10 past the hour, wherever you are, unless anyone's on the half hour, but I think it's 10 past. <laughs> Okay, I'll type it in the chat.
Hey there, welcome back everyone. If you're here and don't feel like turning on your camera, could you just say hey in the chat so we know who's back? Hey. All right, cool. Um, Kambangi, are you back? Maybe he's not back, but all right. Um, so maybe we can continue. The next um, thing that I had was that I would like to, for us to read together some Ruha Benjamin. So the idea is that we'll read it to each other, um, and maybe it would be easier if I did the, the sharing screen thing again, like I did before. So let me do that. And yeah, so I would like us to read the introduction together. I would like to check before we begin exactly how many pages it is, because I think it might be a bit longer than I. It's like 15 pages, is that right? No, no, not quite. Fourteen. Okay, so it's about 14 pages, so it's a bit long, but I figured as we're all getting used to each other and meeting each other in this way that it would be nice to read to each other as a way to, way to get to know each other as well. So, um, Ah, Sebastian's coming back. Would anyone, and I think we can do this, maybe read until you feel like you've read enough, and then you can say pass, and the next person can take it up. Um, yeah, and I can be the scrolling person. Would anyone like to start? And let's try to read the whole thing together. And if you have questions, maybe we can collect them in the pad for now. Uh, I can start. Cool. Thanks, Jesse. Yep. Um, OK, so Discriminatory Design, Liberating Imagination by Ruha Benjamin. And she starts with um, two quotes. All paradises, all utopias are designed by who is not there by the people who are not allowed in, by Toni Morrison. And what is so astonishing about the fact that our prisons resemble our factories, schools, military bases, and hospitals, all of which in turn resemble prisons, by Michel Foucault. Technology captivates, capturing bodies. Dash cams on the front of police vehicles recording traffic stops turn deadly, as with the arrest of Sandra Bland on a Texas highway. Robot cranes reaching 30 feet in the air, monitoring images and heat signatures throughout Camden, New Jersey, deepening police occupation of impoverished neighborhoods. Crime prediction algorithms labeling black defendants higher risk than their white counterparts, reinforcing popular stereotypes of criminality and innocence behind a veneer of objectivity. Electronic ankle monitors wrapping around the limbs of thousands of people as they await trial or serve parole, an attractive alternative to cages more humane and cost-effective than jails, we are told. Tools in this way capture more than just people's bodies. They also capture the Im imagination, offering technological fixes for a wide range of social problems. Electronic tracking and location systems are part of a growing suite of interventions dubbed techno-corrections. Indeed, these interventions come bubble-wrapped in rhetoric about correcting, not just individuals, but social disorders such as poverty and crime. In the first ever report analyzing the impact of electronic monitoring of youth in California, 
we learned that e-monitoring e entails a combination of onerous and arbitrary rules that end up forcing young people back into custody for technical violations. Attractive fixes, it turns out, produce new opportunities for youth to violate the law and thereby new grounds for penalizing them. But perhaps this is the point. Could it be that we don't need techno corrections to make us secure, that we need social insecurity to justify techno corrections? Captivating technology examines how the management, control, and correction of poor and racialized people provide the raison d'etre for investigating in discriminatory designs, investing in discriminatory designs. The volume aims to contribute to a longstanding sociological concern with structures of inequality. These default settings encompass legal, economic, and now computer codes and move past an individual's intention to discriminate by, foc by focusing analysis on how technoscience reflects and reproduces social hierarchies, whether wittingly or not. From credit scoring algorithms to workplace monitoring systems, novel techniques and devices are shown to routinely build upon and deepen inequality. Racist and classist forms of social control, in this sense, are not limited to obvious forms of incarceration and punishment. Rather, they entail what sociologist Carla Shedd calls a carceral continuum that scales over prison walls. And good time to pass, I think. Who would like to pick it up? Um, I could go. Hello. Yeah. Thanks. Um, even what is now popularly known as the prison industrial complex is vaster than most of us realize. As the editors of Captive Genders, Eric Stanley and Nat Smith catalog, it includes immigration enters, um, juvenile justice facilities, county jails, holding rooms, courtrooms, sheriff's offices, psychiatric institutes, along with an extensive set of social relations that include prison labor, privatized prisons, uh, prison guard unions, food suppliers, telephone companies, commi commissary suppliers, uniform producers, and beyond, the carceral landscape overwhelms. Indeed, the enormity of the terrain is overwhelming, especially for those individuals, families, and communities that are caught in the crosshairs of this carceral regime. But what the following pages reveal is that the sticky web of carcerality extends even further into the everyday lives of those who are purportedly free wrapping around hospitals, schools, banks, social service agencies, humanitarian organizations, shopping malls, and the digital service economy. Technology is not just a bystander that happens to be at the scene of the crime. It actually aids and abets the process by which carcerality penetrates social life. It does so in part because techno-scientific approaches seem to fix the problem of human bias when it comes to a wide range of activities. But as law professor Patricia J. Williams insists with respect to colorblind interventions more broadly, the application of such quick fixes becomes not just a shortcut, but a short circuiting of the process. And while there is some hope for a broad-based solidarity precisely because of how far reaching carceral logics are, racialized groups continue to pay a much higher price for this failure to deal squarely with the deep currents of social life. Uh, the new gym code. So how should we understand the duplicity of technological fixes, purported solutions that nevertheless sediment existing hierarchies? First, it is important to reckon with the way that Emerging technologies can reinforce interlocking forms of discrimination, especially when we presume they are insulated from human influence. This insidious combination of coded bias and imagined objectivity is what I call the new gym code, innovation that enables social containment while appearing fairer than discriminatory practices of the previous era. This riff on Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow considers how the reproduction of racist forms of social control in successive institutional forms, slavery, Jim Crow, ghettoization, mass incarceration, 
now entails a crucial socio-technical component that hides not only the nature of domination, but also it allows it to penetrate every facet of social life. So I think I'm just gonna pass it on to somebody else. Cool, thank you. Who would like to continue? Uh, I can continue. As I've argued elsewhere, these post racial upgrades appear necessary and even empowering, which is precisely what makes them so effective at exacerbating inequality. In this way, it is a kind of racial minimalism that allows for more and more racist violence to be less and less discriminable. Those truly transformative abolitionist projects must seek an end to the uh, Carcerality uh, in all its forms, uh, from the state sanctioned exercise of social control, a la Big Brother, to everyday forms of surveil surveillance that people engage in as workers, employees, uh, employers, consumers, neighbors, uh, a la Little Brothers. Taken together, such an approach rests upon an expansive understanding of the carceral that attends to the institutional and imaginative underpinnings of oppressive systems. Indeed, Abolishing the carceral um, continuum requires investment in a continuum of alternatives to address the many social problems that the prison industry is tasked with managing, but thereby perpetuates. In the words of uh, Angela Davis, the aim is not prison-like substitutes for the prison, such as house arrest, safeguarded by electronic surveillance bracelets, rather uh, positing decarceration as our overcharging strategy, we would try to envision a continuum of alternatives. So uh, imprisonment, demilit uh, demilitarization of schools, revitalization of education at all levels, a health system that provides uh, free physical and mental care to all, and the justice system based on uh, preparation and reconciliation rather than retribution and vengeance. A colossal undertaking indeed. This is why nothing short of the creation of new institutions that lay claim to space now occupied by the prison and all of its carceral uh, antennae and appendage can form the basis of the new social transformation. To the end, this discussion aims to bow the vital scholarly and activist investment in abolition and transformative justice by offering the first uh, sustained analysis of carceral dimensions of emerging technologies across a wide range of social arenas. The central question animated the text, animating the text are who and what are fixed in place to enable innovation in science and technology? What social groups are classified, crowded, coerced, and capitalized upon so others are free to think, uh, to think, tinker, experiment, design, and engineer the future? How are novel technologies deployed in carceral approaches to governing life well beyond the domain of policy? This book also asks to what end do we imagine? How can innovation in terms of our political, cultural, and social norms work toward freedom? How might technoscience be appropriated and reimagined for uh, more liberatory ends? Ultimately, this volume is about what people can do, are doing about it, from Frederick Douglass to Dorothy Roberts, African diasporic artist to black feminist abolitionist. The following pages also explore visions of fashioning the world in radically different ways. Uh, I'd like to pass it to someone. Thanks, Alexi. Would someone like to pick it up? Um, I can go next. Um, discriminatory design. Um, in rethinking the relationship between technology and society, a more expansive conceptual toolkit is necessary. On the Bridge of Science and Technology Studies, STS, and Critical Race Studies, two fields not often put in direct conversation. This hybrid approach illuminates not only how society is impacted by technological development, as techno-determinists would argue, but how social norms, policies, and institutional frameworks shape a context that makes some technologies appear inevitable and others impossible. This process of mutual constitution, wherein technoscience and society shape one another, is called co-production. In her book, Dark Matters, for example, sociologist Simone Brown 
examines how surveillance technologies co-produce notions of blackness, explaining that surveillance is nothing new to black folks, from slave ships and slave patrols to airport security checkpoints and stop and frisk policy practices. She points to the facticity of surveillance in black life. Challenging a technologically determining approach, she argues that instead of seeing surveillance as something inaugurated by new technologies, to see it as ongoing is to insist that we factor in how racism and anti-blackness undergird and sustain the intersecting surveillances of the present order. Anti-black racism in this context is not only a byproduct, but a precondition for the fabrication of such technologies. Anti-black imagination put to work. A co-productionist analysis calls for more than technological or scientific literacy, but a more far-reaching socio-technical imaginary that examines not only how the technical and social components of design are intertwined, but also imagines how they might be configured differently. To extricate carceral, carceral imaginaries and their attending logics and practices from our institutions, we will also have to free up our own thinking and question many of our starting assumptions even the idea of crime itself. Um, I'd like to pass it on to anyone that would like to read next. Um, I'll give it a try. Thank you. Uh, take, for instance, a parody project that begins by sub subverting the anti-Black logics embedded in new high-tech approaches to crime prevention. Instead of using predictive policing techniques to forecast street crime, the white collar crime early warning system flips the script by creating a heat map that flags city blocks where financial crimes are likely to occur. The system brings not only the hidden, but no less deadly crimes of capitalism into view, but includes an app that alerts users when they enter high risk areas to encourage citizen policing and awareness. Taking it one step further, the development team is working on a facial recognition program to flag individuals who are likely perpetrators. And the training set used to design the algorithm in, uh, includes the profile photos of 7,000 corporate executives downloaded from the popular professional networking site linked, uh, LinkedIn. Not surprisingly, the average face of a criminal is white and male. To be sure, creative exercises like these are only comical if we ignore the fact that all of its features are drawn directly from actually existing proposals and practices in the real world, including the use of facial images to predict criminality. By deliberately and inventively upsetting the status quo in this manner, analysts can better understand and expose the many forms of discrimination embedded in and enabled by technology. In fact, the late legal scholar, uh, scholar Derek, uh, Derek Abel encouraged justice, a radical assessment of reality through creative methods and racial reversals, insisting that to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be. Discriminatory design, moreover, is a conceptual lens to investigate how social biases get coded, not only in laws and policies, but in many different objects and tools that we use in everyday life. Consider public benches designed with intermittent, intermittent armrests that make it impossible to lie down. For the typical passerby, the inconvenience is negligible, but for a person who is homeless, it is another concrete reminder of one's denigrated status as human refuse, kept out of sight, out of mind through techniques of invisibilization. Discriminatory design finds expression too in the spiked corners of luxury flats in London, single occupancy benches in Helsinki, and caged public sitting in France. In the last case, public criticism was swift and fierce, forcing city officials to remove the benches almost right away, demonstrating how everyday people can and should resist discriminatory designs as antithetical to the common good. Um, pass it to someone. Thanks. Would someone else like to pick it up? Uh, I can go. Thanks. Uh, to illustrate how much of public life has been effectively privatized, German artist Fabian Brunsink 
created a metered batch that requires the user to pay in order for the spikes to retreat into the seed. For instance, iProc reminds us that although discrimination may no longer be expressed in the forms of whites only, signs hanging in storefronts or painted on the back of benches as they, as they once were, seemingly neutral pay-to-use policies enforce social boundaries and deepen inequities nonetheless. The meteries of public life is evident in education, healthcare, policing, policing, and more, where public goods that are nominally for everyone are structurally restricted because historic and ongoing processes of discrimination ensure some people can easily feed the meter while others must contend with the spikes. Keep in mind that well before 18-year-old Michael Brown was murdered by officer Darren Wilson in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, the municipality was exacting a pernicious form of economic terrorism by targeting the predominantly black citizenry for fees and fines in the, in the millions of dollars. As one observer put it, it's easy to see the drama of a fatal police shooting, but harder to understand the complexities of municipal finances that created many thousands of hostile encounters, one of which turned fatal. Like an ordinary park bench enforcing the line between wanted and want unwanted, public policies overseeing the most mundane aspects of social life act like so many skewers violently prodding, prodding those who cannot pay up. The metering of social life is a key feature of the carceral infrastructure that extends well beyond prison bars. It contributed to the tragic death of Sandra Bland, who was charged $5,000 in bail and their and thereby skewered by punitive apparatus, which those which, with means could have walked away from. According to a federal study, there are over half a million people sitting in city and county jails who have not been convicted of a crime. In 2016 alone, there were over 800 documented fatalities among those in lockup because they could not, they could not post, post bail, a form of premature death the pol political geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore defines as a key feature of racist state violence. And considering that a meter is a measurement tool, whether it is metered benches or metered public policies, the pervasive use of this technology to govern public life signifies a perverse calculus of human worth. And I would like to pass it on to someone. Thanks. Would someone else like to pick it up? Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll pick it up if that's okay. Thanks. Please do. Ferguson in the future. It started with a captivating image, then a question. As the rebellion following the murder of 18-year-old Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, was underway in the summer of 2015, I came across a photo online, figure 1.1, that, arre that arrested my attention. It showed a wall with the words, Ferguson is the future, spray painted on the side. A future, I wondered, of militarized police to terrorize residents using technology of, of war, or a future of courageous communities who demand dignity and justice using techno technologies of communication. The uncertainty, I think, is what we make of it. Ultimately, these four words served as a catalyst for the symposium I co-organized with Mo Moya Bailey and Ayanna Jamies Jamieson, which we called Ferguson is the Future, incubating alternative worlds through art, activism and scholarship. This book, however, did not grow directly out of that gathering in the conventional way that turned, that talk turned into chapters. In fact, only four of the contributors, Benjamin, Gaskins, Nelson and Robert, participated in the symposium. Rather, the inspiration came from a less direct source, a question posed to the last panel by my colleague, by my colleague, legal, sorry, by my colleague, legal and cultural studies scholar, Imani Perry. In characteristic fashion, she pushed the conversation in a direction it had not yet gone. The question I have is about technology. I was thinking about technologies like bullets and tanks and the weapons trade as a technology. As a technology. One of the things that was so remarkable about Ferguson and why it captured the imagination is that people with their flesh confronted technologies of domination and stood in front of them. And so the question I have is about the ethical relationship to technology. It could be a tool for incredible imaginative exploration but it is question, questionably the mechanism for our domination in the current era. And so how do we, particularly given how we are all implicated in technology domination, how do we think about how to grapple with our relationship to these tools? 
Of all the incredible insights that grow out of Ferguson as the future, this question lingers the longest for me because of the way it forces a clear-eyed clear view of the life and death stakes of technoscience. It does not permit a, a Twitter-friendly formulaic response, but acts as an ongoing provocation that forces all of us who seek to intervene in the deadly status quo to think anew about how to navigate material and ethical matters. Captivating technology offers only one way forward. Mapping technology is a nation that are far, often far more elusive than the bullets and tear gas that meet protesters on the streets of US cities, while pointing to alternative geographies with the very idea of what tools are essential for multi-species flourishing can engender ongoing experimentation and justice-oriented design. Uh, I'd like to pass it on if that's okay. Would someone else like to pick it up? I'll pick it up. Cool. Thanks. Uh, radio imagination. This text engages with a number of foundational thinkers who have worked to develop an ethically grounded and sociologically informed orientation towards science and technology, as well as more recent scholarship that explores how racial logic enters labs, clinics, public policies, pedagogies, and discourses about technoscience. Whereas an overwhelming focus of previous tech work is on genetics and the life sciences more broadly, a number of scholars have broadened this emphasis to investigate the ways that racial and gender norms and hierarchies impact everything from basic healthcare to artificial intelligence. Some of the most exciting developments in this arena go on to articulate ideas for how to construct technoscience differently. Also crucial for this discussion is scholarship that examines how science and technology operate through, with, and against policing, prisons, and carceral systems. A key feature of this work is the understanding that racialized groups are not only the objects of harm and neglect, but the meaning and power of racial hierarchies are enacted through the techno-scientific processes. In a particularly disquieting example, Anne Pollock examines the case of the Scott sisters whose dual life sentences were commuted by the governor of Mississippi on the condition that Gladys Scott donate a kidney to her ailing sister, Jamie. Pollock shows how being eligible to contribute a bodily resource can enact membership in a group, be it family or state. In the United States, prison is not just a metaphor for power and control, but a potent way of organizing bodies and space and constituting uh, and depriving citizenship. The biomedical fix of organ transplantation is one of many techniques in which the rights, responsibilities, and coercive possibilities of political membership get enacted. In attending to the underside of technoscience, the contributors to this volume remain attuned to the groans of bondage that echo whenever and wherever liberty rings. Together, our aim is to cultivate what Octa Octavia E. Butler called the kind of imagination that hears radio imagination. Radio imagination is offered here, serves as a methodological touchstone for ethical engagement with technoscience, where the zeal for making new things is tempered by an ability to listen to the sounds and stories of people and things already made. In the broadest sense, at stake is the category of human itself, who defines it, inherits it, wields it, who rents it, tills it, toils for it, who gets expelled from it, buried under it, or drowned as they risk everything to inhabit it. Reviving humanity. The rhetoric of human betterment that surrounds technoscience is not only a shiny veneer that hides complexity and camouflages destructive processes. The, this feel-good grammar also makes it difficult to recognize, much less intervene in, the deadly status quo. Addressing such distortions, including the lack of attention to race in theorizing new technologies, Black Studies scholar Alexander Wahele joins a wide range of thinkers who challenge the liberal humanist figure of man. His intervention builds on Black feminist theorizations of the human, particularly the work of Sylvia Winter, who posits different genres of humanity that include full humans, not quite humans, and non-humans, through which racial, gendered, and colonial hierarchies are encoded as natural distinctions. 
As literary scholar Zakaya Jackson aptly explains in her thesis for an alternative genealogy of posthumanist thought, one that foregrounds Winter, Franz Fanon, and Amy Cesar. The figure man is a technology of slavery and colonialism that imposes its authority over the universal through a racialized deployment of force. And as several of the chapters in this volume make clear, fiction, writing, and other creative works offer some of the most compelling post-post post racial vision, visions of challenging entrenched social, social hierarchies in a way that do not flatten differences. And I'll pass it on. Thank you. Would someone like to pick it up? Yeah. Uh, in the engagement with speculative fiction writer Octavia Butler, scholars Bailey and Jamison explain how this work concerns itself with the human problem, with the ways that human do nature as both intelligent and hierarchical being dooms them as to destruction in an infinite number of ways. A bleak vision, yes, but only if we decide not to achieve a radio imagination that listens for and signals other ways of being human. In short, a black feminist approach to posthumanism and all of its techno scientific promises is not about including the oppressed in the fold of Western liberal humanism or about casting out humanism writ large, but about abolishing one particular genre that, by definition, dominates and divorces all others. Ultimately, it is an approach toward building in which myriad life forms can flourish. If, as argued, the rhetoric of human betterment distorts the understanding of the muted facet interplay between technology and society, then a true going commitment to justice has the potential to clarify and inspire possibilities for designing this relationship anew. Justice, in this sense, is not a static power, but an ongoing methodology that can and should be incorporated into designing processes. As Jara Jafari Naimi and colleagues powerfully contend, we develop the value of justice by testing and observing the work that the justice hypothesis does in various situations and recognize situations as just or unjust through reference to this learning. As such, a justice-oriented approach to science and technology should not be limited to calls for inclusion as a vague multicultural platitude, nor is it only about ensuring that a wide cross-section of humanity can access technological goods and services. A fixation with barcodes, after all, has a way of bearing more radical possibilities. As just one example of tech growth, prompting socioeconomic decline, the rapid development of Silicon Valley has contributed to an alarming homeless hate in East Palo Alto, a predominantly black and Latino area where more than one third of school children now face housing instability. How then might we craft a just oriented approach to techno science? It starts with questioning breathless claims of techno utopianism, rethinking what counts as innovation, remaining alert to the ways that race and other hierarchies of difference get embedded in the creation of new designs and ultimately refashioning the relationship between technology and society by prioritizing justice and equity. I'd like to pass to someone. Thanks. Does anyone want to pick it up? I could pick it up. Thanks, um, <laughs> Uh, Refashioning race and technology. Uh, 
as it turns out, the process of refashioning re the relationship between race and technology may en entail actual fashion. Uh, Hypan Labs, an international team of women of color working at the intersection of technology, art, science, and futurism, is experimenting with a wide array of subversive designs, including earrings for recording police altercations and visors and other clothing that prevent facial recognition. Uh, all part of the of their not safe as fuck project. Uh, okay. Um, interestingly, Hypon Labs created a neurocosmetology lab that creatively employs hair braid electrodes to stimulate and uh, an increased flow of concentration, uh, which finds its pedagogical counterpart in the work of. Uh, researchers at uh, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, led by one of the volume contribu contributors, Ron, Egla Ron English, uh, who are developing culturally situated design tools. One of the RPI projects, Cornrow Curves, focuses on the underlying mathematical and computational thinking involved in uh, cornrow braiding, uh, which aligns with the mathematician's sense of fractal patterns as iterative scaling and the computer scientist's sense of algorithm. Cornrow Curves is a part of a broader community informatics initiative which is recasting what counts as techno science and who we think of as innovators. In the process, the creative, even beautiful dimensions of liberatory design abound. Um, finally, you, uh, the reader, are encouraged to explore the edges of, edges of your own imagination. The border patrols others have imposed as well as monitoring systems you may have installed yourself, including those gatekeepers, the squatting in nooks and crannies of your thinking, forcing you down certain pathways and telling you to avoid others. How can we expect to change social structures when we uh, continue to nurture the same habits of mind in our mental structures? Mm, reflecting on mass incarceration and abolition, Angela Davis advises, dangerous limits have been placed on the very possibility of imagining alternatives. Uh, these ideological limits have to be contested. We have to begin to think in different ways. Our future is at stake. Davis reminds us that the carceral imagination limits not only our beginnings, beings, our beings and bodies, but also the many fix, uh, fixes proposed. Captivating technology aspires to deepen our collective understanding of the significance of imagination, drawing on anthropologist Arjun Apudre formulation that imagination is. And I would like to pass. Thanks. Um. I can pick it up unless someone else is burning. Okay. Um, no longer a mere fantasy, opium for the masses whose real work is elsewhere. No longer simply escape from a world defined principally by more concrete purposes and structures. No longer elite pastime, thus not relevant to the lives of ordinary people. And no longer mere contemplation, irrelevant for new forms of desire and, and subjectivity. The imagination has become an organized field of social practices, a form of work, both in the sense of labor and culturally organized practice, and a form of negotiation. The imagination is now central to all forms of agency, is itself a social fact, and is the key component of the new global order. The task then is to change not only forms of discriminatory design in our inner and outer lives, but to work with others to imagine and create alternatives to the techno quo, business as usual when it comes to techno science. As if part of a larger struggle to materialize collective freedoms and flourishing, 
if, as emphasized in this book, the, carceral, the carceral imagination captures and contains, then a liberatory imagination opens up possibilities and pathways, creates new templates, and builds on Black radical tradition that has continually developed insights and strategies grounded in justice. Onward. I think I will take this opportunity of speaking and interrupt. So maybe we will end there <laughs> for now. So strategies grounded in justice will be the end for the reading uh, for now. So what I wanted to invite everyone to do is we're going to do a think pair share exercise. So I'd like you all to think with yourself for about five minutes about questions that came up or things that you're still kind of mulling over, things you didn't understand. Um, maybe you thought whatever you thought and kind of take some notes for yourself. After about five minutes, I will put you into um, groups of two. And I'd like for the groups of two to discuss with each other. And then we're going to come back and have a conversation with the larger group. So in the meantime, I will chat about how to put you into groups, but in the, but please, uh, till about 55, maybe take some notes if you'd like, if that's how you think.
Lauren, I'm just I'm just uh, reviewing uh, the option for the breakout rooms, but it, but it seems I have to. Uh, it has it's like an option that ha that is found in the, in the settings, and it has to be done before the meeting, like before the mm -hmm. the, the session starts. So unfortunately, for now, we we cannot do it, but we can en enable it for future sessions. I think uh, I'm also like consulting with with Kasra right now because. Um, because I think they don't have this option enabled. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just checking with him right now, but, but it seems that this is like an option uh, enabled in, in the settings first before every, okay. every meeting. So right. I'm re really sorry, just, just trying to, to see how, how we can manage it hey, out. Hey, don't worry about it. Why don't we just skip it for this time and we can just hop to the big discussion and we can meet each other in small groups next time. Okay, perfect. Like maybe technically it's too stressful. Um, okay, so did anyone, are there any things that anyone's still sitting with or questions you had or keywords that came up for you? Um, maybe this text is super familiar for you, maybe it's not. Um, I, I know we're across many different contexts as well. This is also very American US based. Maybe you would say this is different from where I'm coming from. Maybe you wouldn't. Um, I want to create some space for discussion, so. Um, I'm just going to shout <laughs> now. Um, uh, I think uh, I think it's a really interesting introduction to the book, um, and obviously there are some overlaps with like, let's say, Western white male established uh, voices that, like, if you're familiar with them, you would have expected a quote. But it's really nice that there wasn't a quote potentially. So like Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism, for example, or um, possibly even Derrida with the whole justice approach uh, in terms of. Um, justice is the one thing that you constantly have to work towards um, and that is never like arrived at. And but what I thought was really powerful was because um, what I'm mostly familiar with in terms of uh, philosophy of technology approaches um, is uh, the concept of mediation, right? And how to uh, analyze um, technological mediation. Um, and I think what's interesting here is that while in the typical approaches you would kind of look at, okay, so what are the, how does the technology kind of imply a human positionality of, of body perception and experience? I think this uh, approach to carceral imagination is really, really interesting and really powerful because it kind of names something that perhaps in ordinary approaches to analyzing technology, you wouldn't necessarily look for um, in terms of how, um, obviously technology enables us to do things and it enables us to do it along specific vectors though as well. So um, the carceral imagination I think is, is something that I definitely took a lot of notes on while, while reading through it. Um, and I think it's something that's quite interesting and also something that's really frustrating I guess um, because then um, uh, like in terms of speculative design or like radical design um, like the hyphen labs would pursue. I'm not familiar with the work, but from from the description, um, it sounds like that kind of goal. It's obviously always hard to distinguish, okay, am I in, and I'm, I'm using quotes here with my hands, but you can't see me, but like, am I only acting within and against the carceral imagination? Um, but then again, the flip side of that, is that like a very privileged question I'm allowed to ask myself because I'm not really given who I am. I'm not really worried about the carceral continuum <laughs> as like a threat to my bodily safety, so to speak, uh, much more so than um, just in terms of like a much looser kind of cognitive uh, limitation. Um, but those are just some, some thoughts. Um, but yeah, I think the, what I took down as the, um, that captivating technologies or technologies of capture kind of implicate the whole carceral imagination of going about the world, um, I think is a, is a very interesting framing um, for sure. Anyone 
else have any thoughts about the text? Other than this question of what is carceral imagination? How does it relate to bodily safety? Thanks for your points, Jesse. Maybe also like these questions of problemizing, problematizing where and which um, subjectivities are affected and how we can think a bit more about this as well. Maybe through the lens of interdependency or I have um, just some thoughts. Um, it's my first time reading the text and being introduced to these concepts. Um, and I think what's interesting is how you were saying that it is very, very US based concept, um, context. And so I'm wondering how we can apply words like continuum and um, imagination to other countries and other castle world carceral conditions, because especially the subjects and subjectivities that are involved in that um, depend very much on the situation of each country and where people are positioned in relation to those systems and societies. So I wonder how can we even use the term continuum or can we even use um, certain of these words in other, in other ways? Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, riffing on that, I'm also interested in this, like hearing more about this liberal imagination against the carceral imagination, and I guess like all the nuance and the questions that come with that, especially um, in regards to yeah, is 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 the car is the liberal imagination like set against carceral imagination in a way that could potentially. Um, produce like a paranoid imagination or um, or or veer into a more positive um, constructive imagination. I think there could be a lot of uh, gradations of different kinds of solutions. Yeah. Maria, could I ask you a solution for what? Oh, no, I meant, I'm just thinking about, um, I want to learn more about the kind of questions and nuances that come with thinking of um, going against the carceral imagination and the problems potentially in um, maybe developing like a paranoid imagination that mm -hmm. could potentially be like liberal, seen as liberal, but maybe um, is not constructive but also the positive end of that. <laughs> Thanks. I was thinking of some things. Uh, sometimes I get uh, sort of frustrated of to see the institutions, how they work like uh, schools and prisons, like their similarities and how to change it. And if we have to change it, we, we, we have to act within these institutions. So I, I have a lot of anguish with this sort of, and in the text, it, seem, it seems that it has a sort of critiques toward this, um, trying to change from from inside the system, but there is pro, pro, there is a spark probably that can still act inside of the system. But I thought that it was really interesting that radio imagination uh, idea of how to propagate it, how to transmit it, and. I don't know. I think that institutions they have a really a violence, a, a story, historicity that they carry. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's difficult to talk with it and always uh, actualizing those uh, those violence. So, but what if what if we don't actualize violences and uh, I don't know, reframe them in, with other intensities, you know, just thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. 
but of course that 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 it's important also some some critical thoughts on it and yeah thanks for your point Raphael I think um maybe I'll I'll offer one thought that kind of maybe brings together something Ariana was saying and something you were saying Raphael is this question about locality of locating the prison industrial complex within the U.S., but then also thinking about the violences of institutions and institutional practice. And I think that a lot of something that I'm interested in with critical pedagogical modes, but also more generally, is the, re the reproduction of violences within institutions like the institution of policing, for example. And that the reproduction and the history of the institution of policing, of course, is culturally situated differently depending on the country you're in but the ways in which it reproduces violences has resonances across contexts. And so these kinds of institutional, and this is what um, I picked up a little bit on that Ruha Benjamin also talks about, by doing your job well, you can also be perpetuating violences. And I think that this is something that extends beyond just the US context that she touches upon, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm quite interested in her texts also to read with bell hooks. Yeah. Uh, sorry. And sorry. by doing well, what is meant by this is it somehow just abiding by the rules and kind of like continuing the, you know, um, participating in what is expected from you? It can be, yes. So um, by being a good police officer, for example, there can be things that you're expected to do that could perpetuate harms or also within this context, for example, like by being a good instructor for you all, um, it's not expected that we have subtitles, for example. So that can be a kind of uh, violence or exclusionary practice um, for, for other people to join this classroom space, for example, just to bring it to this small level. So this is a kind of doing your job well is not always, um, yeah, it's not always, like who are you working for or like what in what service or what institution are you supporting through that um, and acting well i think this is what ruha benjamin means i was also i um i thought it was very interesting when uh ruha benjamin, benjamin quoted um iman zakia jackson that says that the figure man is itself a technology of slavery so I guess that man in this case is a very specific manifestation of the human, as in the one that possesses other living beings as objects. And yeah, I, uh, I think this, um, you know, um, equating man as mm, kind of like making man into the very technology, saying that man is a technology can have very, um, there can be many, uh, uh, I would say, interesting impl implications coming out of this and how, how what happens if we think man man him himself um, as a, as the technology um i was thinking if if say if all if all oppressed is connected um where do do you situate yourself like uh side of the oppressed or, or the oppressor um also this the question of we um what is we is it human is it real or is it imaginary uh this the language uh our dear lord talks ab about uh common language, uh, this policing also, I uh, keep thinking about the structures of pol policing. Um, yeah, just, just questions here. Yeah. No, thanks.
did you guys like the text? I mean, yeah. Or because also maybe like emotional responses are also things that are welcome here. <laughs> this is also another way to look at something. I don't know if now would be a good time, but I would sort of be interested in hearing the last paragraph that talks about imagination. Yeah. I don't remember who was the quote and it was not, it sort of listed three, three separate past imaginations. Here, maybe I'll share my screen once more. Oh, um, I guess I've, can someone else share their screen? I think I cannot anymore. Oh, now I can. Just uh, turn to you once again to host. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, it's okay. Here we go. Maybe we can make it so everyone can next time. Um, this this context, uh, this uh, one here, right? Here, I'll highlight it. Is this the one you were thinking of? Yeah. Alexis, yeah. Yeah, that, that was it. Sorry. You want to read it out? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so, aspires to deepen our collective understanding of the significance of imagination. No longer mere fantasy, opium for the masses whose real work is elsewhere. No longer simple escape from a world defined principally by more concrete purposes and structures no longer elite pastime, thus not relevant to the lives of ordinary people, and no longer mere contemplation, irrelevant for new forms of desire and subjectivity. The imagination has become an organized field of social practices, a form of work, both in the sense of, sense of labor and culturally organized practice, and a form of negotiation. The imagination is now central to all forms of agency is itself a social fact and is the key component of the new global order. Cool. What stuck with you about that paragraph, Alexis? Um, I guess I just got, I thought it was exciting, but then I also was thought, questioned it, is, is it? <laughs> um, and and who, who who is contemplating in that way and who, and who is not. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was tripping out a little bit on the, the thought that, that perhaps our online lives and presences are, you know, this manifestation of some original, I don't wanna say original, but some imagination that comes from, from the man. And, um, and now we, we are, there's a move or an interest or a desire to reflect back on that imagination in, in a conscious sense or a conscientious way. Um, that was the loop that it, that, that sort of described to me, it stood out. I think what um, stood out to me about that is that it takes um, a concept that, you know, we all think of the imagination or have imagined the imagination, um, but it makes it more concrete. So how do we imagine the imagination as a place? Um, could it be a structure or, um, you know, previously maybe even a prison structure? Um, and how do we kind of expand that space? so that we can actually include the kind of um, actions that it, that it asks us to take, like actually implementing change within the imagination. So for me, at least, it, it helps me to think of it as not even belonging to me or in my head, um, but as a place that we construct, if that makes sense. Um, that's just <laughs> a tangent that came to me. Mm. But I think that these questions about what kind of um, imaginations we have about what technologies or what uh, practices of being together 
uh, for example, we carry around also structure what becomes possible in many, like in many instances. So I, it, one example recently is within uh, Germany here where I'm based, um, the idea of like seeing a household, for example, during COVID times or being allowed to visit family, but not, you know, to travel for other reasons. Um, brings into questions of lots of um, who who is a family unit? How do you decide who it is that you're allowed to see? What d demarcates a household? Um, these questions about normative practice, for example. It's also a, it's a cultural imaginary of, of course, you see your family, but then for some, who is family and how is that? Is that only through marriage or are there other ways of making family or kin? Uh, Another thing that I would look into, maybe going back into this text, is um, thinking about like what is meant by the imagination. What's the definition of imagination? Um, because imagination has a lot of association with like freedom and mutability, and um, kind of lifting off from the the grounding of like concreteness, something that's um more set like imagination brings up a lot of like notions of freedom and i would i don't know i, I would explore that and see i don't know what exactly is being meant here yeah. it almost feels like it's um asking us not to let our imagination be free because i feel like that would be a lazy solution um it's, I think it's asking us to kind of check on that imagination and what it's doing. This concept of imagination here, I don't know if I'm, uh, if it's appropriate to bring other authors in, but Audre Lorde has this short text, Poetry is Not a Luxury, and then uh, in which she describes basically the you know, poetry as the imagination in like a broader sense is not something that is somehow superfluous to, to reality. It's, it's not something that, that, uh, that we partake in just for fun or just because um, um, we do it in free time or some, in some kind, of, some kind of a day dream activity, but it's necessary for, you know, survival you need to imagine other otherwise in order yeah to to navigate life i guess mm -hmm. that's a really beautiful text if anyone hasn't read it poetry is not a luxury by Audre lord yeah okay well does anyone have any uh, final thoughts that they would like to share before we move on. I'm quite comfortable with silence and I really hope that this can be a chance for all of us to chat with each other and get to know each other a bit more and kind of dig into these ideas. So we'll have some chance to do that over these next coming meetings as well. I appreciate the pregnant pauses and the uncomfortable silences and the moments of mulling over. So this is all welcome. I was thinking some things from the last uh, contributions, like when Kamwangi uh, spoke about who is we and um, which humans are part of our home, for example. Uh, it made me think like uh, how many, with the velocity of things, many agents come to intervene in our imaginations and how to which relationships which uh, we want to uh, nurture uh, which with which humans are, you know how to distinguish these intentions uh, and these intensities it was something that it seems important in this imagination diplomacy I don't know also when you talk, when you was saying like ah, when you are at, at the covid like uh, how to you know it is a 
there are situations that it seems that you can uh, feel these intensities and what are the intentions and how to to create networks which are re related to this um, you know how to uh, to get in this radio uh, frequency you know? there are situations that it seems that you are uh, open for it Rafael, could you, um, maybe I didn't understand the point about COVID though. Like, could you say a different way or one more time? Yes, uh, there are uh, situations that are kind of drastic and they put you in a, in a specific position, in a displacement, let's say. And if you, you can see relations in a different way from a displacement. Mm -hmm. So you come to reevaluate some things and it, it is more like thinking uh, these events as a displacement that I was thinking. Hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I have uh, as a way to bring today like to a close, because we'll end at uh, 30 past. I've got two things. One is um, I want to share um, an access writer. So this is something that I will, um, it's in our Google Classroom, which I hope everyone has access to. I saw someone chatting about it in the, in the chat. So if you don't, I can also email it to the whole group. Um, and maybe what I will do is just pull that up briefly so people can see. Um, first, just to ask, is anyone familiar with the idea of an access rider? Is that something that um, you've heard of before or work with personally? No? I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. Okay, cool. Um, good to know. So let me just pull it up briefly. I think I can share my screen again. Mm, yeah. Cool. So can you see my screen again? Yes. Cool. Thank you. So this is um, like instructions um, <laughs> for an access writer, if that wasn't clear. Uh, and I'll just say a little bit about it and then I will ask you to work on this for uh, part of homework. Um, and so this idea of an access writer actually comes from the world of music. And so if you are a musician, perhaps you show up to an event, uh, an event space and you like need this amp for your guitar and these cables and you like these Cheetos and like these M&Ms, you know, only the green ones or whatever. Um, it's kind of like, it comes from the world of music. And so the idea is that you send this ahead of time to working with, to working with institutions um, and say, this is what I need in order to make my participation possible and good for me. And so this is something that's been taken up within the disability community of, um, and also beyond. So the trans community has used this. I've, I've encouraged my artist friends to look into it. I think it's also interesting to overlay it into a more academic space. And so it's a kind of question, it's a kind of bunch of questions of asking yourself, like, how do you, how do you feel when you come to a space? What types of things are in a space that make it feel like, oh, this is a space for me and I can work here? Because we all have different needs when it comes to that. Um, so the invitation is to maybe look through these, like, these prompts. I have like a series of steps to do it. Um, and I would like it if everyone would, if you feel comfortable, share this with me. Um, in, in, in a way to focus on making this classroom a more accessible space. And we can talk about this next time. Maybe it won't work for you. Maybe it will, it will work for you. It's also open if it doesn't. Um, but it's a series of prompts to kind of write up a, a, like a list of what works for you and what doesn't. Um, yeah, so this is an access writer. And then the last thing that I wanted to, and everyone has access to that in the Google Classroom, um, are there any questions about that before I continue? No? Okay. Um, and then the last thing is I want to just do something kind of fun. 
So um, in this moment of looking into filter bubbles and carceral technology and the ways in which information is sorted or pre-sorted to all of us, I would ask everyone, if you use Google, to open up a Google page and type in climate change is. And if you want, you can send a list maybe in the chat and we can use this as like a poetry moment to end. Let's see what the what we get at the end. So climate change is, is what I'd like you to type in. And let's maybe post the first two or three kind of autofill responses, if you will, as a way to close. And I'll type what I get as well. It's a real shirt. <laughs> it's complex. We've got answers to your questions. That's funny. All right, cool. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the translation. <laughs> Interesting. All right, so thank you for participating in this small experiment with me. Um, the so the one thing to do for homework would be to work on that access writer. Let me know and we'll talk about it next time. The other thing is um, I'd like you to read uh, Bell Hooks Teaching to Transgress, just the first, the introduction of it. Um, and we'll talk about that next time. And maybe hold in mind some of the points that we brought up from the Ruha Benjamin text and see if reading Bell Hooks Teaching to Transgress produces any sorts of dissonance or resonance um, or both with that text. Uh, Lauren, just just before we end, um, I wanted to ask you if we have uh, any presenters or respondents according to your scheme of uh, note takers and drawers for next uh, session, or would you like to follow another scheme for that? Yeah, the idea for the presenters and respondents would be for people to do this kind of collective note taking um, practice that I've proposed. So this is the drawing and note taking practice. So. That's maybe also a good reminder for people to go ahead and sign up um, within the pad, which for me just crashed, but hopefully it's working for other people. Um, it, I put like a kind of number one, number two for both the drawing and the note taking every day. So if everyone can sign up, that would be great. And we can look at that together over the at the end of the course. 
Um, can I just ask how you would like us to send you the um, rider? The access rider? Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, maybe you can email it to me would be the easiest. If, if you'd like to share it on the Google Classroom so other people can see it, you're also welcome to do that. I will try to use that as a platform for the course. Um, but the email, my email is at the um, top of the syllabus, which you should see, but I can also type it here just in case. And I guess in terms of a deadline for that, um, if you could send it to me before, like maybe by Friday next week, so I can take the time on Saturday to look it over before we meet next time. Sound good? Cool. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thanks so much for your time. And Thanks a lot, Lauren. Next week. Thank you. Yeah. See you, Lauren. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.